So the absolute, just to be clear, the absolute is the actual building blocks of which everything is composed. In other words, if we want to use a term from philosophy of science, the absolute is qualia. Colors, sounds, feelings, emotions, tastes, smells, thoughts. These sort of sense perceptions, we might say, this is the substratum of which reality is composed. And everything else is secondary. Reality is not composed of atoms. Atoms are composed of colors and thoughts and feelings and sensations. Science has that relationship inside out. And that's why it's so confused. And that's why it's stuck with the hard problem of consciousness. Here's another helpful analogy to distinguish between relative and absolute truth. If you think of the Sherlock Holmesian universe, the fictional universe of Sherlock Holmes in you know, Victorian England or wherever, and whenever you know, his universe takes place, um, there are truths within the fictional universe of Sherlock Holmes, you know, facts, facts that we could cite. I haven't actually read the Sherlock Holmes books, but if you read the books, you can make factual claims. Like, for example, Sherlock Holmes lives in a house on such and such a street with such and such a house number. Is that true or is that false? It's one or the other. Or you could say Sherlock Holmes is either married or unmarried. One of them is true, one of them is false. He has children or he doesn't. True or false. His parents are still alive or they're dead. True or false. Um, he has a a detective partner named Watson, true or false? And so and so on. You know, we can generate a list of factual statements about the Sherlock Holmes's, uh, you know, fictional universe. Do the cars drive on the right or on the left in the Sherlock Holmesian universe? Supposedly that's like a fact. I don't know. It depends on how the author set that up. Um, those would all be relative truths. What are they relative to? They're relative to how the author chose to write the story. See, the author could have written the story otherwise. Author could have given Sherlock Holmes a different street address, different house number, uh, uh, a, w a wife or uh, children, or his parents could have died or they could still be alive or uh, you know, any number of things. Cars can drive on whatever side of the road of the city that, that the author wants because it's, it's a fictional universe. It's a, it's a dream. It's imaginary. But we can still make factual statements about how the author chose to write that particular story. And that is what science is doing in our dream world here that we call life. So when science is making its objective factual statements, it's doing exactly the same thing as we would do with the fictional universe of Sherlock Holmes. So there's no surprise that it works. Yes, it works in a relative sense. It's true in a relative sense. It's true that Sherlock Holmes has a partner named Watson. Does that make Watson real? Does that make Sherlock Holmes any more real? No, they're still fictional characters. The relative truth doesn't care about the actual reality of what it's talking about because all it is is just a comparison. Likewise with what science is doing here. Like, does science ask the question whether atoms are real or not? No, science doesn't care whether atoms are real or not. All it cares about is just measuring what's there and manipulating it. Does science care if the moon, the moon is real or not? No, landing a, moon, a la landing a man on the moon has nothing to do with the reality of the moon. You can land a man on an imaginary moon as long as the man is imaginary too. That's the mindfuck of all this. So even though that whole Sherlock Holmesian universe is a fiction, it is imaginary, it is a dream, and it is all relative, and it could have been imagined otherwise, the way it's being imagined itself is absolutely true. Do you get that? 
the substance, we might say the actual physical book on which the Sherlock Holmesian story is written, that would be analogous to absolute truth in this metaphor. See? The actual substrate of the book is existence. The book exists. It's consciousness. It exists in your consciousness. And that is absolutely true. So you see, contrary to what many people think about the absolute and the relative, you know, people fall into one side or the other, is that we have people who become dogmatic absolutists, like religious fanatics. That becomes a huge toxic problem. They give absolutism a bad name. And then we have people who become the opposite of that. The polar opposite is like total relativists. And they believe everything is just a, everything is just open to interpretation. Everything is just purely subjective. There is no absolute truth. The truth is just whatever we want it to be. And then they, they create all sorts of disasters as well. This becomes a problematic worldview as well. Um, the truth is somewhere actually in between. It's kind of intertwined. It's that the absolute and the relative, these are not polar opposites, but rather these are deeply intertwined, like a double-stranded DNA helix aspects of one unified whole reality. Relativity is not a contradiction of the absolute. And the absolute truth's existence is not a contradiction of relativity. It's actually the two perfectly, seamlessly, cohesively add up together like the yin-yang symbol.